as Bob made clear, there's always concerns about what will happen to archaeology and facilities like this, and a real urge to make sure the public understands what we're doing with archaeology as professionals, to give a sense of the significance of this endeavor, and to really have it be an engaging endeavor that helps lots of people, both in understanding local heritage and a sense of why history is important. And we've been trying with the Looking for Angola project to really front the notions that this is a significant past in southern Tampa Bay and one that people should know about and once they know about can actually have important repercussions. It's also an archaeological project, a multidisciplinary community-based research project seeking material evidence of that early 19th century community on the Manatee River. And as we've been working with various communities, it also is very much turned into a commemoration and remembering of resistance to slavery in the 19th century and the abiding struggle for freedom that passed through this area at one point. The project started with some historical research done by Dr. Cantor Brown. I have to start with just a simple statement. I do feel it's an important statement to make. Uh, no people wanted to live in slavery. And the peoples who were enslaved in North America in the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries always tried to break away from slavery. The vast majority were not successful, but a few were successful. And what they did was either rise up in revolt or run away. And the people who ran away were referred to either as escaped slaves or in the Caribbean context, maroon, or even sometimes self-emancipated Africans. Our historians have documented, you can see in that uh, map over there, about 50 maroon communities in the continental U.S. in the 17th, 18th, 19th century. In the late 1980s, Cantor Brown, who's been engaged in doing history on Tampa Bay, came across some documents that, frankly, were confusing. It seemed to, thank you indicate that there was yet another escaped slave community on the Manatee River. And he published the results of this historical archival study in 1990, laying out that there was this community on the Manatee River, adding to this storehouse of knowledge about people resisting slavery. Vicki Oldham was a TV journalist in Sarasota, working on a documentary on the history of Sarasota. She had met Dr. Brown had read his articles and thought, I think quite appropriately, that more than just academics should know about this story. I really wanted to put it forward into the public sphere with all its implications. But Vicki laid out, and she's been the project, uh, the chief project investigator from the beginning, that this was a story of people overcoming challenges, escaping slavery and going down the west coast of Florida to live in freedom, that people should know that this area, which seems to be dominated by recent development, actually has a really interesting history on Avenue. And that the way to find the material evidence was to build a large research team to bring out all the facets of the Angola saga. Fort Muse, just north of St. Augustine. Quite a clever strategy. These are people who escaped from slavery who would not want to be recaptured and sent back into slavery. And we know from the various expeditions sent down from Georgia, they fought to the death. And they, in fact, frightened the Georgian militias who came down much more than the Spaniards ever did. In the 1980s, Kathy Deegan from the University of Florida and Jane Landers at Vanderbilt University, one an archaeologist, the other historian, located the remains of Fort Muse. And they published it uh, in both uh, academic and popular versions of the Federal Park at north of St. Augustine for Fort Muse. These black warriors, as they're sometimes known, were part of the many peoples who lived in Spanish La Florida. When the English took over in the 17th century, back, it seems others had seen the from the plantations of Georgia and South Carolina. And one of the parts of understanding the history for Angola is recognizing just how many peoples were around in Spanish La Florida. One historian at the 
University of Georgia actually says very clearly, Central Florida really wasn't Spanish. There was maybe a couple of thousand Spaniards in Spanish Hill, Florida. They were Cuban fishermen living on the coast, particularly on the islands on the west coast, coming for half a year to collect fish and then bringing them back to the Havana market for the larger world economy. And there are these people, and these are some of the names we refer to them, runaway slaves, black Seminoles, Maroons, African Seminoles, free men, self-emancipated Africans, Maroons, all of whom were living either in the northern tier of Florida or some in the interior of the peninsula. But they're also people who are trying to overthrow Spanish rule as well as help these runaway slaves. The term now is used in a very different way, but in the 19th century they're referred to as filibusters. These were British officers who resigned their commissions for helping to train both the black Seminoles and the Seminoles of Florida against the, at this point, Americans in Georgia and Alabama and South Carolina. And throughout this period, we have American soldiers coming down. And we're going to talk a little bit about those, because that's essential for understanding the, the history and context for Angola. In some ways, the near history of this is unbelievably confusing. And I should spend the next hour and a half disassociating all the different components. You're not going to have such luck. So I'm just going to give you the highlight. While the US and Great Britain were fighting the War of 1812, and there were battles raging at New Orleans, Andrew Jackson also brought his troops down into the panhandle. And that was considered part of the War of 1812, but also, in hindsight, it's also considered part of the First Seminole War. Because Andrew Jackson was clear that the British were getting support from the Seminoles and black Seminoles, and he wanted to stop that. The Spaniards were incapable of stopping his volunteers from coming into Pensacola and the Apalachicola area. The British, these filibusters, had created a fort on the Apalachicola River. Uh, I, I excuse the language, it's the archaic 19th century language. It was referred to as the Negro. And it was a headquarters for hundreds of escaped slaves and settlers fighting against the Americans. The US Army, the US Navy, during the time this is part of Spain, Spanish territory, goes up the Apalachicola River and what the military officials said very clearly, it was a lucky shot. Hit the magazine, blew up the Negro fort, leading the survivors, several hundred survivors, to go further south to escape Andrew Jackson's army and try to continue to live in freedom. That broke the resistance to slavery on the northern part of Florida. It also was part of the victories for the War of 1812 for the United States. The, the history is quite clear. Andrew Jackson wanted to stop these runaway slaves. He wanted to prevent Florida from being a haven for slaves. And so he moved south into Suwannee. In 1818, the famous, well, hopefully famous, Battle of Suwannee occurred. And the details have, again, very clear from the US military records. The black warriors stopped the American troops. And the hundreds of people who had gathered at the villages at the Suwannee River, the ones who had escaped from the Negro were able to escape the US military, move even further south. And we happen to know where they moved further south, because one of Andrew Jackson's aides make it, makes, made it very clear in a report that is easily accessible in the archives. In 1818, James Gladson, you might know that name if you know American history really well, because it's a piece of the Southwest that was named after him. But Gladstone, and I'll just read the quote, and again, excuse the, the archaic language, the Bay of Tampa is the last rallying spot of the disaffected Negroes and Indians, and the only favorable point from whence a communication can be had with Spanish and European emissaries. Uh, Edward Nichols is one of these filibusters that I mentioned before. The British officer, Edward Nichols, he actually wasn't a British officer, he had resigned his commission, but the point was taken. His report is established in that neighborhood, and the Negroes and Indians driven from Muscogee and Suwannee towns have directed their march to that quarter. It seems after 1818, they moved down into southern Tampa Bay, again, to escape being put back onto the plantations in slavery. The, the story will sound very depressing in a moment, but it, uh, it'll, it'll come back up in a little more positive way in a few minutes. 1821, Spain is impotent against US forces finally negotiates a treaty basically giving Florida to the United States. Andrew Jackson comes back to the border of Florida 
and is very clearly aiming to attack southern Tampa Bay to, to take care of the last resistance of these black warriors. The Secretary of War, the term for Secretary of Defense at the time, explicitly said to Andrew Jackson, do not go down there. You're not to cross the border. Yet we read in newspaper accounts, and Cantor Brown is the one who gets credit for finding this archival material, a discussion of a terror spreading along the west coast of East Florida, a terror that broke the establishments of both the blacks and Indians who had fled the Suwannee River. The person who leads that march down is not Andrew Jackson, but Cherokee chief and US general Andrew William McIntosh, a very close ally of uh, Andrew Jackson. The US Congress is enraged by this action. They get what happens. Right. The archival record doesn't actually show us that Andrew Jackson told McIntosh what he does tell us he met with 21 and then shortly thereafter McIntosh went down into Florida and they destroy the community at the Manatee River and another one at Charlotte Harbor. They take away at least 300 people from the Manatee River, taking them back up to slavery in the north. Others, we know, escaped into the interior of Florida. But others, this is where the story isn't totally depressing, others go south into what's now the Everglades. And they go down to what was then called uh, Cape Florida, Key Biscayne. And with the help of Cuban fishermen, these people they had been trading with on the coast, as well as these British busters, they escaped by ship across the Florida Straits to the British Bahamas. One of the more amazing parts of Ross and Howard's archival research that on the Bahamas, among these people who were known as black Seminoles, in 1828, a British official in Nassau notes that for seven years, some four Negroes from the United States have been living on Andros Island. I, where's my little? Here's Nassau. This is Andros Island here. And they were living on the west coast. That takes us seven years from 1828. That's easy, 1821. Exactly when those raids were occurring down the coast of Florida, these people appear on the west coast of Andros Island. And even more impressive in her research, again, I credit Rosin Howard, my, my colleague on it. So look, you see this name here, Sam. There's other names as well, but let me just point on him. Rosin Howard is an ethnographer, did what ethnographers always do when she started working with the Black Seminoles on Andros Island. She had kinship charts. This is just in the tool kit of what anthropologists always do. And she had traced the ancestry of some of the people living in a community that's called Red Bays on Andros Island. And the people she was talking to could go back generations, one of whom was Sammy Lewis. The only one. There are other names as well that could be traced back to that list of people who were there in 1821 on Andros Island. These quotes, again, excuse the language, four Negroes who had come from Florida. And so we end up having this really interesting story from the historians and the cultural anthropologists. Clearly, people have been escaping slavery going down to Spanish Florida. We know that from Fort Musée. That's all been wonderfully documented by Jane Landers and Kathy uh, Deegan's archaeological work at Fort Musée. We know about the history at the Negro Fort on the Apalachicola River. The Battle of Suwannee is well documented. And we know they ended up uh, sev you know, several hundred on Andros Island. Where had they been in southern Tampa Bay? That's the archaeological question. Let me make two points. In this. This is, this is our I want to give you a taste of what we have. Everyone wonders where we got this name Angola. That catches people's attention. In 1828, in the treaty, well, let me step back. In the treaty that transferred Spanish La Florida to the United States, the Spanish crown insisted that people who owned land had the rights to those lands. And a land commission was created to uh, provide the, the legal documents for the Spaniards in now US control. And in fact, the state of Florida has all these records now online. One of them, by a father's son named Cadiz, who we know lived on Anna Maria Island, just off the mouth of Man River, asked for the land on the Manatee River, 640 acres on a place called Angola. This is just too 
enticing of a, a term, the best that we can assume, and we, we are making an assumption, that these Spanish fishermen who had been trading with the Seminoles and Black Seminoles in the interior for their food while they're out fishing on these islands must have had this name from these escaped slaves. These went through every other hypothesis imaginable and almost none except, except for a group of Africans or African people of African descent living in this area and so we assume that's where they got the name. We have another spot that kind of takes us to the Manatee River then known as the Oyster River. After Florida became part of the U.S., John Lee Williams traveled around the states or the territory and produced a book called The Territory of Florida, which is a, a good read for anyone who's interested in Florida history. And he describes what he saw. He was just an intellectual who wanted to record the land for, for Americans. And one of the things he notes at the end of the book, in the place between two rivers, what we know now today as the, as the Manatee River, then the Oyster River, and known today as the Braden River, is a place called Negro Point. Again, excuse the language. And they, he lists two of the famous British filibusters who Andrew Jackson actually captured during, the, uh, during the, the Battle of Suwannee. And he says they had a plantation with 200 Negroes. And this seems just too enticing. We just assume that this is his understanding of how these British filibusters were helping these escaped slaves. And we just read through the early 19th century language. So we have a place, these old Spanish fields, these fields related to these Cuban fishermen, right there at the point where the Braden River meets the Manatee River. And so this is the Manatee River. Here's Anna Maria. Here's the Manatee River. Here's the Braden River. And so this is the spot John Lee Williams is referring to. As you might know, Bradenton is over most of this southern shore. It's uh, as big as St. Pete, but a very and so immediately we face some challenges in trying to do archaeology, knowing all the buildup of communities, uh, houses, factories, stores, and so on. But we were enticed. And it wasn't just from those archival records that things were enticing. In the early 1880s, at the Little Manatee River, a resident of the area found that wooden drum which Jane Landers, again that historian at Vanderbilt, identified as an African-inspired drum. It's now at the University of Florida. In 1971, right by the Braden River on the Manatee River, that wonderfully large object, which is a fire back, which is when you have a fire, you put this big iron thing in the back so it radiates heat at you. For all the northerners, that makes sense. Floridians, just imagine the days for heating and air conditioning. It's a very large object built in the 18th century that at the time, until basically 1840s, supposedly no one was living on the Manatee River. And here's something very large was there connected to the British system. Uh, two years ago, uh, near the Manatee Mineral Spring, by, by basically the middle point of the Manatee River, this uh, bayonet made in Harper's Ferry in 1818 was recovered in someone's yard as they were gardening. So we have some objects that tell us that, in fact, these stories from the archives are part of the history for this area. We decided, and this is part of the public archaeology, because of the urban area, but also because we felt we need to explain what we were doing, that to start talking about escaped slaves with no context wouldn't make sense to people in Bradenton, let alone anywhere else. People wouldn't be able to imagine it. So in the beginning, from the beginning, looking for public outreach, uh, thanks to the help of the Florida Humanities Council, we had various lectures across the Manatee River. We had tours, we had objects, uh, artifact displays. We have a website. Of course, you have to have a website these days. Vicki Olden was a film because she made a film. And the local PBS station, WEDU, was kind enough to play it. And I've heard it kind of still gets played at like 4 in the morning. I teach at New College. My students don't actually sleep at night. <laughs> So I don't quite know why they're watching television in the middle of the night, but they, once in a while they see me and they feel guilty and they get to work. <laughs> but we tried our best to get the word out about this, to do a lot of education, so that as we started doing excavations, it wouldn't just be coming out of nowhere, but with a sense of what we were trying to accomplish. As we were thinking about where to excavate, the Manatee River is about 60 miles long, so there's lots of places to look at. We ran into an immediate problem at that point that John Lee Williams pointed us towards. 
Today that point has the ruins of the Braden Castle. The Braden Castle was the big house for a plantation by Joseph Braden starting in the 1840s. It also is surrounded by very small homes with very small yards from the 1920s. And we realized that at this point in the research, we shouldn't be destroying historical remains to try to see if there's anything underneath. So although this is probably the most likely place to find material evidence, we opted not to go there. I'll tell you about the two places we've looked at materials, both at the Tabby House ruin at the mouth of the Manatee River and the work we've been doing at Manatee Mineral Springs, kind of in the middle of things. The, if, when you go to MSM Point Park, you'll look across Manatee River and you'll see DeSoto National Memorial, which also has a pre-Columbian man and is dedicated to the DeSoto expedition. They also have this small little building called the Tabby House that frankly until recently wasn't t interpreted. But in the late 1990s, one of the Park Service archaeologists did some excavations it was always assumed that it was associated with William Shaw, you see in this photo from the 1840s. What was interesting from the excavations was the artifacts actually come from the beginning of the 19th century. And there are different explanations for this. Maybe William Shaw was using old things, but actually he was a merchant who traded in new things. It doesn't quite hold, but we, we leave open the possibility. It's quite feasible. And we know this from the Suwannee River and from the Apalachicola River. These British filibusters created little buildings as trading posts to trade with these maroons. And this location is just inside the cove, is just at the cove, so you couldn't see this building go from Mexico or Sarasota Bay, but easy transport into uh, the Manatee River. And these objects are all from their mean ceramic date ends up being 1818, just at the point we assume that the British were helping the people at the Manatee River. The other place we've been actually doing the excavations is Manatee Mineral Spring. It's a couple hundred yards away from the Manatee River. And it's one of the few sources of fresh water in this region. And we, it is also owned by a group called Reflections of Manatee, which is a nonprofit dedicated to historic preservation. Their major interest is the 1840s uh, Anglo-American settlement, but they've been wonderful hosts in trying to discover the other histories that are located on their property. In 2004 and 2005, we started by just doing standard test pitting. And uh, I'm actually perfectly happy to admit this was the wrong strategy. That as working through it, what we found was a lot of artifacts, particularly late 19th and early 20th century artifacts, a tremendous amount of artifacts, none of which were answering our research questions. And we realized that while this is a perfectly appropriate technique in some situations, to find a group of people who are trying to hide, we weren't going to find it with standard test pitting throughout an area, and that we'd end up getting stuck with a tremendous amount of material that really we didn't have questions for. So we took another route. Thanks to an underwater archaeologist at Moat Marine Laboratories, we decided to do an underwater survey. As I said, that drum was found from the Little Manatee River. People would have to cross the river to get to the south side of it. People might have dropped things in the river. There's also a number of rituals we know from South Carolina, people putting things in rivers for, for a part of sacred rituals. And so Kaz Kazi did a survey. And it's in the areas in red. A and again, I have to just let you know, and we've been very open about our process throughout. We knew that the US Army Corps of Engineers in the 1890s, early, 19, early 20th century, had dredged the Manatee River to make it deeper. And what Kazkazi found out was, in fact, they did a heck of a good job. They cleaned the entire river bottom. There was nothing on this river bottom, uh, except some things that some boaters had dropped off in the last couple of decades. Clean, clean. He was depressed by it. He had worked elsewhere on the West Coast. where he found a tremendous amount of artifacts, nothing at all. So we started thinking, well, what are we doing? How are we going to do it? That our initial intention of public archaeology, I think, fits the dominant model. This is something I, I borrowed and modified from one, some of my colleagues. Typically, I think the popular image of archaeologists is kind of this Lone Ranger image, the Indiana Jones, you just kind of go out there, you do whatever you want to do, you find things. Professional archaeologists overwhelmingly don't do that anymore. We have this sense of public participation. That's how Looking for Angola began. A sense that we should work with the public, we should educate them, we should reach out and make sure people knew what we were doing. With these challenges we were facing, with the lack of results, 
we actually start shifting to more of a collaborative model, working with people in Bradenton, not just telling them about what's going on, but really asking them to be part of this process and to work with both the people in the local community, but also the descendant community. And you're going to see some of those uh, contributions as I finish up the second half of this presentation. In doing the collaboration, in asking audiences in Sarasota and Bradenton, what was the most important part of this endeavor? What we were told over and over again is that we should teach this history to school children. As we had been doing some of that other archaeology, underwater archaeology and that test pitting, the local newspaper and local TV media were just enthralled with it. I think any of the archaeologists in the room know that if you take out a shovel and call the news, they show up. It's just a miracle happens. You take a shovel and the TV reporters come almost immediately. Well, the Sarasota Hill Trib was really taken by these stories. And they have a newspaper and education program. And the head of that newspaper and education program just took it upon herself to create what they were called tabloids and ended up creating four of these mini newspapers that they gave to the school children of Charlotte County, Sarasota County, Mandy County, and ultimately Hillsborough County and Pinellas County. And Rosin Howard brought them to Red Bay, to Andros Island, to the children of, uh, in the Black Seminole community. That's what you see right there. We worked with school children, had them learn about archaeology, finding places where we knew the ground was disturbed so they wouldn't destroy anything, but would learn the processes of excavation as well as mapping, particularly in low-income areas of Bradenton. It became an important way to kind of get people out, try to help kids learn about what was there. And one of the benefits of this collaboration was that we had continual community involvement. People appreciated us taking kids out, both with the work in the classrooms and the work in the field. This notion of collaboration started radiating out. And, uh, and I'll foreshadow this is going to be one of the conclusions for this talk. When we, after we had done the test, testing at Manti Mineral Springs, we saw there was a lot of potential, but we didn't want to, I particularly didn't want to do more digging. And so the answer, of course, was remote sensing, which is one of the, part of the toolkit. And we had put in a grant for the state, and it was just when the state was running out of money. And so we were a bit stymied. Wooden Technologies is an engineering firm. And they were doing some work with their radar taphonomy, which they, they do for under, underground utilities. And they're working in one of the, it's a national, they're working in St. Pete. And one of the people who heard about what we were trying to do contacted them. And they volunteered their equipment and did a survey, as well as a fellow from the US Army Engineering Department with this other fancy equipment. And over these three acres around the Mineral Springs, gave us this 3D under, uh, views of what was underground. You can see the, the different breakup of it. I won't show you all of them, because frankly, it took me a while to read these and understand them. But this is just one piece of that larger puzzle. And what we saw in those dark marks were various things to be examined. What you see in the yellow boxes were these little circles. And I looked at this, and I looked at this. There, as you see, 32 inches down, about 80 centimeters down. And as an archaeologist, all I could think was, these are post molds. And I was trying to think, why would they be post molds? Well, that isn't about the Anglo-American settlements, wouldn't really imagine. But these escaped slavery, maybe it was the huts. Right? You think about the huts, the chickies used by the Seminoles. And so as an experiment, to see if this radar actually was going to be giving us any information. I took some of the students from New College and some local volunteers, and we did a test excavation. And just at the point of 80 centimeters down, lo and behold, we found a post mold. And so that information actually is quite accurate, that they are showing us archaeological features. The engineers were impressed. They weren't sure it was going to work. They're still a little upset that it was about 20 centimeters away from where it should have been, but I was happy that it was at the right level. Frankly, nothing we'd ever find with testing, with shovel test pits. The ceramics just near this are suggestive. It wasn't enough material for me to actually make any strong statements. And my report was very clear. It was suggestive that we should look more. And that meant, hey, the ceramics actually fit the time period for Angola. Just not enough to really make the case. And so we got to the point that now we know this is a promising place to excavate. We don't have to just excavate randomly around the spring. We know this is one 
some kind of structure that we need to understand more. But as we were doing this work, we wanted to also put some effort into this community that's known as Red Bays. Again, Madison Howard is our contact. Again, a lot of credit to the Sarasota Herald Trib. As some of you might know, the Sarasota County Schools have these things called smart boards that basically I could touch the computer the screen and I could do things with it. I'm pretty impressed with this technology. I don't have good language for it. Well, the Herald Trib decided that they would send one of these boards to this community at Andros Island. It's a very poor community. And so I was part of a team that brought it. It ends up being very hard to bring a smart board to Red Bays. It was sent to NASA and they take it on a ferry, take the ferry to bring it to a truck to drive it over and have the people set it up. And in the one elementary school, the one school in Red Bays, this community of a couple of hundred people, the school teacher was just ecstatic that they had this new technology, which no one else in the Bahamas had and has the potential for linking up the students in Sarasota with these folks. While I was there, we started thinking about what information can we gather at Red Bays that can be helpful for the Manatee River? Again, we're trying to build models to know what to expect. There just isn't a lot of work on maroon sites. These are people who didn't want to be found. They were escaping slavery. What to find? Well, Red Bays, most of the houses are kind of typical British houses. But for the elders of the community, and there's Reverend Newton, who's uh, 84 years old now, they have both memories and also kind of an urge to remember other kinds of structures. Structures that actually they are clear when the hurricanes blow by, this is where they stay, not in the cinder block houses. 